is from Paul's letter to the Romans, and that is chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as I have written. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that are not. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No mistrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, the words, it was reckoned to him as righteousness, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. And our gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners uh, came and were sitting with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but for those who are, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I'm wondering if there are any grammar freaks in this congregation. <laughs> if there are, I want to tell you that the title of the sermon does not have a title in it. This is not an adjective and a noun. This is a noun and a verb. And it's properly a plural noun. Okay? So, no apostrophes needed in others. <laughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. Our rock and our redeemer. but I adore the Indiana Jones movies. Um, I think my all-time favorite is, of course, going to have to be Raiders of the Lost Ark, the first one. But I really do love the Holy Grail also, the, the third one. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and it's almost as good as the first one. How many of you have seen that? I want to show of hands. Yeah. <laughs> and for you women, Indiana Jones, uh, Sean Connery is a almost as gorgeous as Harrison Ford, right? <laughs> I just saw it again about a month or two ago, and I just loved it. I watched it in this sort of schizophrenic state of mind. A part of me is just purely enjoying the, the suspense and the witty remarks, and, and, uh, and the other part is critically analyzing the theology behind this retelling of the Holy Grail myth. You know, remember, remember that myth of the Grail centers around the idea that the cup that there was a cup which caught Jesus' blood during the time of the crucifixion, and anyone who drinks from that cup will receive eternal life. Well, of course,
course, Jesus' blood does grant eternal life, but that's a whole other story. It has nothing to do with grail. And so let's just leave theology aside from now, and, and we're going to skip over all that witty commentary between Sean Connery and Harrison Ford, and we're going to skip over uh, all the, the chases and the, the, all that stuff. And so we're going to wind up at almost the last scene, okay? There they are, heroes and villains and all, in this thousand-year-old temple with the grail guarded by the usual booby traps, and, and the bad guys send minion after minion up the hall, and they keep flying back down with their heads rolling after them, and, and, um, uh, and then somewhere in the melee, Sean Connery gets mortally wounded, and, and the only way that Indy can save him is by daring the gauntlet himself. And being virtuous as well as smart, he, he deciphers the clues and he gets to the last obstacle. But that last obstacle is a bottomless chasm far too wide to jump. The grail, which holds the key to life for his beloved father, <clears throat> I do it for Sean Connery too. Um, <laughs> And, and, and 
and then no doubt uh, Abram didn't keep kosher. I mean, the rules hadn't been given yet. And he certainly didn't have a mezuzah on his tent post, and, uh, and to top that off, he wasn't even circumcised yet. So where's this righteousness stuff? So what did Abram do to deserve being made the father of many nations? He believed God's promise. That was all. He believed it, and he acted on it. And that, in God's eyes, is just as good as being righteous. Well, okay, I hear you say. Uh, but what about all those, divide, all those devout people who had carefully followed every little detail that the Mosaic Law wanted because that's what they thought that God wanted? I mean, doesn't that count for anything? I mean, maybe Abram's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, but didn't their own righteousness count as righteousness? I mean, come on. Uh, weren't they righteous on their own account because they'd been following God's law? Well, Martin Luther answers that question in a letter introducing his own commentary on the book of Romans. You must not understand the word law here in human fashion, i.e. a regulation about what sort of works must be done or must not be done. That's the way it is with human laws. You satisfy the demands of the law with works, whether your heart is in it or not. But God judges what's in the depths of the heart. Therefore, his law also makes demands on the heart and doesn't let the heart rest content in works. Rather, it punishes as hypocrisy and lies all works done apart from the depths of the heart. And then he goes further. And he says, the works of the law are everything that a person does or can do of his own free will and by his own powers to obey the law. But because in doing such work, the heart abhors the law and yet is forced to obey it, the works are a total loss and utterly useless. But to fulfill the law means, means to, to do its work eagerly, lovingly, and freely without the constraints of the law. It means to live well and in a manner pleasing to God as though, as though there were no law or punishment. It's the Holy Spirit, however, who puts such eagerness of unconstrained love into the heart. With the Holy Spirit, can any one of us say that we always fulfill every bit of God's law automatically? just because it's what we naturally want to do from the depths of our being? Of course not. I mean, this total inability of ours to keep the law is why the psalmist can say in Psalm 14, the Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They're all alike perverse. There is no one who does good, no one. And that is why we, like Abram, rely on God's promise rather than our own righteousness. Let's, let's go back to verse 21. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, the word that was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and raised to our justification. We're called to the same faith that Abram had. Just as Abram trusted God's promise that he would make him a great nation, even though he was pushing the century mark before Sarah finally conceived, believing not only against all conventional wisdom, but also in the face of his wife's doubts as well, so are we to believe that God's promises of peace and purpose in this life and eternal happiness in the next can also be relied on. And then, We don't earn the gift, mind you, but we have to go where God has put it for us to find. That 
let's step out into the unknown. Sometimes over what looks like a bottomless chasm is what the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard called the leap of faith. It's not a blind step. It's not a foolish one. But it's a leap made of confidence and trust. I mean, sometimes, you know, like the, the way a trapeze artist would launch herself out into the air, trusting her partner to catch her at the end of the swing because he, she is both confident in her, in her ability, but trustworthy, knows that he can be trusted to follow through on what they've been doing together for so long. Now, Martin Luther's great insight back in the late 15th century that it is faith alone that leads to salvation, revolutionized the Christian church. It was what the Reformation was all about, and it's the core of what you and I believe today. And yet I'm going to disagree. It's not faith alone that leads us to take that step. It's faith plus love. Because you not only have to believe God's promises, you have to also want them. You have to want them more than what you leave behind when you begin that long journey into the unknown. You have to want God. You have to want to know God. You have to want to love God. You want to be with God more than you want or love the things in the world. There's an old song that goes, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. And that's the attitude that's underneath every single leap of faith. Nowadays, you need that attitude to be able to take small leaps, small steps of faith. Because if you don't want what God promises, it's much easier to ignore the evidence and refuse to believe. And society makes it easy for people to do that nowadays, doesn't it? It encourages people to do that used to be that in order to be accepted, you had to pay at least lip service to Christian principles, but not anymore. Not anymore. You have to do it now because you want to, not because there's pressure on you. And there is now a little bit more risk than there used to be. Most of us here believe in Jesus, don't we? I mean, we at least all, we say the creeds together, we sing the hymns, we say the prayers, we talk the talk. And I suspect that most of the time, we do our best to walk the walk. But ask yourself this question. How much are you really willing to risk for Jesus? Do you love enough 